Richard, welcome. We've made Hi. it. <laughs> Great to be here. I uh, had some adventures this morning. I'm sorry to delay so long. Yeah, you had to go to space, which is very, <laughs> uh, <laughs> very uh, accurate. Yeah, uh, you know me. A, compared to all, the things that you're into and the things we talked yeah. about before. So yeah, people out in the live stream, thank you for being here. Thank you for being patient and sticking around. Yeah, Richard had a little bit of uh, internet trouble. He's in this glorious but somewhat remote location. Mm -hmm. uh, so, right, so uh, we, and we do have cable modems up here, but the cable cable modem died. We're in the Pacific Northwest, and it looks like the extreme heat may have damaged the wire. So now they they want to replace the wire. But I had I got on the beta of Starlink a while back. Yeah, absolutely. fun to play with. But suddenly we're depending on Starlink because the because the cable would have stopped working. Although, and it's been pretty good. But you know, if you're watching this, you can see the video and certainly this audio. Uh, it's coming to you from space. Yeah, it may or may or may or may not uh, glitch just a little bit. But the recording there are some dropouts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and thanks for your patience with that. All right, Richard, you ready to kick this off? Do it, Richard. Welcome back to Talk Python to me. Man, it's been uh, been a year, uh, quite a year, as I recall. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, we're we're living in like dog years or something like that, uh, right? Every yeah. year is like seven years. You know, I I don't know if we spoke about it, but I definitely joke that you know historians when they come back and study this time frame, they won't be able to say you know what decade or what era they study. It'll be like, well, what part of twenty twenty did you study? What part of twenty twenty one did you study? Did you study the summer or was it the spring? Because that's a different specialty. How much it's changed, and that we're still living with a certain level of uncertainty. You know that that the at the time that we're recording this, the Delta variants having an impact, and I think everyone's sort of leaning back again, going, "How bad is this going to get?" So yeah. yeah, I don't know. A month from now, things would be very different. Either way, yeah, it, it could go either way. That's that's mm -hmm. absolutely right. Yeah, so I'm cautiously optimistic, trying <laughs> trying to, you know, live life be safe but not be huddled in a corner for yeah too badly for, you know and for your own sanity i mean one nice thing about being up on the coast is like the view is impeccable the we're right on the ocean you'll probably even hear a bit in the recording like to be able to be out here and breathe the air and, and uh, just try and connect with folks even if it's where it has to be remote that's all yeah yeah well for the audio podcast listeners tell us mm -hmm. tell us how you are speaking to us <laughs> How, how am I speaking to you? Yeah, yeah. How are you on the internet? <laughs> uh, I, you know, via Starlink through through. Uh, I got on the beta for Starlink right at the very beginning, and because we're in this relatively, we're opted in very early on. Uh, I, there is cable modem service up here, but it's broken at the moment, and so there's we're repairs trying to be done this morning, which is one of the reasons we delayed recording. Um, but they have not been successful so far. Counting on Elon's magic yeah. as one of as now the largest satellite operator in the world, uh, and and soon he'll be more satellites than everybody else combined at the rate he's going, and it's been pretty good. So there are dropouts; it's never flawless. And this, what we're asking it to do, this real time thing, is of course the hardest thing to do. Right, right. We're going real time to space, which is pretty amazing. But it's it's kind of cool. I haven't had a chance to speak with anyone who's had real experience with Starlink. So it's it's neat to yeah have you're it part of, you're you know, part of the experiment now, friend. You know, <laughs> that's here we right. are <laughs> exactly. And, you know, um, we were planning on using high speed wired internet, but yep. it broke, and so it's a really cool fallback to have. Uh, and I think it's actually going to be really empowering for people in places where that's not an option. Yeah, and it, certainly I've talked to a bunch of friends who are all very interested in, it. and because I'm right on the ocean, I have a sky and that's the real problem with Starlink is you need an absolutely clear view of the sky and often when you're in remote locations you're surrounded by trees and trees and Starlink are not friends oh. <laughs> and, and satellites definitely don't mix yeah it just doesn't right. work well I'm really glad that we're able to make this happen and I say that with fingers crossed for mm -hmm. another 45 minutes or <laughs> whatever it's going to be what a time we got yeah well let's, let's hope the satellites are well well aligned for this next period and we'll have a good call yeah absolutely so this episode is going to be like some of the previous ones that you've been on before mm -hmm. and that it's going to be one of these geek out episodes and the geek out episodes i learned about which uh, mostly 
I guess, premiered on .NET Rocks. Is that right? Right. Yeah, it's totally my friend Carl's idea. I, I, would, I did not want to do these. I thought it was a bad idea, and I was wrong. So the first Geek Out was back in 2011, and it was, it was about the shuttle ending and uh, yeah. just my, my thoughts on what went right and what went wrong with the space shuttle. And it continued from there. It became, it became a pleasure for me. I'm a researcher by nature. And, uh, and I've always been organizing my apologies just because I like to read and, and research. And the shows basically drove me to finish. Now make an hour long conversation about that technology. And Isn't that, that interesting about uh, being able to present something? Yeah. That you, you have, have to, to, you close those loops that you're like, oh, that's interesting, but I, I'm not going to dig into that corner or that corner of this thing. And then when oh, you've got to stand up and present it, you know, well, I, I feel like that's a great way to learn stuff in general as, as people in technology, not just for the geek out thing. The, the, the one of the series that I'm very proud of that absolutely the process of making the show has transformed it was the fusion series. Cause I originally thought I'd do a show on fusion, but as I started really organizing all the materials, I realized there was three different shows there. There was a show about uh, national fusion, like the ITER and JET and the National Ignition uh, Laboratories, all of these big government projects. And then there was the tech billionaire pet fusion projects, because you're not a cool tech billionaire if you don't have one. And it was, so it was a moment where I realized, geez, every one of them has one and they're all wacky. <laughs> and then I ran across a set of papers out of Mitsubishi Labs about fusion reactions. And that actually walked us into a real conversation about cold fusion, which surprised me because it, it's like pseudoscience for a long time. But the Mitsubishi Labs experiments in the, in the late uh, 2000s um, were very real and repeatable. They, you know, Mitsubishi was smart enough that when they realized they had something consistent, they handed it over to Toyota, their arch, and said, here, you reproduce this. Because if anybody was going to travel, and they yeah. repeated the experiment successfully. And if you listen to that show, I'll give away the ending. Uh, yes, you can do lower energy uh, nuclear reactions. They are a kind of fusion. It's a part of science that's not well understood. It's more energy to do it than it produces. Just the sort of thing you don't want from a power plant. <laughs> exactly. We can make it happen, but it doesn't produce net energy. Yeah. It, no, that's a, it's the fun part of that show is, is I'm walking Carl through the product. And Carl's always a great everyman for these kinds of things. And I, I actually talk muon catalyzed fusion. And which is a different kind of low energy fusion and uh, very repeatable, workable and so forth. It's just that it takes more energy to make muons than the fusion. Which it turns out is every kind of fusion except stellar fusion. That's how it's always worked. It takes more energy to fuse than it does that it, than it emits. Yeah, well, if you got that much gravity, it definitely is an unfair advantage. <laughs> so, yeah, so this is going to be another one of these geek out episodes, and we're mostly mm -hmm. going to just focus on the energy side. So it's sort of uh, relevant that you're talking about fusion here. Mm -hmm. The other thing I guess that's worth, you know, just giving a quick shout out to is you're organizing the Dev Intersection Conference, right? Yeah, we did. So we did a show back in June as a full hybrid show. So some attendees in person, some uh, attendees remote and some speakers in person, some speakers. We know how to do that. We're hoping to do a more in-person show in Vegas, but we're prepared to do hybrid again if necessary because uh, we, we've, we've pulled it off. But uh, this is a developer show. I mean, we're, we have Microsoft, so there's lots of .NET content, but also web content across the board, plenty of Azure, artificial intelligence technologies, and uh, databases. So it's a, yeah. it's a very big, broad show and a, a ton of fun, and the MGM brand is a great location for it. Yeah, that's really cool. I, I feel like... You know, last time we spoke, this was the pre-Delta, pre-large scale vaccine. And like, mm -hmm. oh, look, we're sort of crossing over the hump. And this is going to be like, you'll be able to sort of put this back on, no problem. And then but it, Delta. And, 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 and again, ask me in stuff. a month and maybe it'll be fine. But at the moment, we're all sort of holding our breath. It's like, we know what to do if we have to. Uh, yeah. I hope we don't have to. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, so let's dive into our, our main topic since okay. uh, we are on a bit of a time crunch uh, since we're going to space. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> on this one, I wanted to talk to you about energy. And I think there's a lot of 
things happening around energy that's both optimistic and amazing as well as you know there's there's setbacks and other things so you know let's let's talk about um sort of the the story of energy specifically mostly renewable energy these days like how are we doing mm -hmm. We're doing pretty well. I mean, obviously, the pandemic changed things. Um, power consumption overall, especially electricity, especially in the West uh, during the pandemic, closing of malls and commercial spaces and so forth, because those spaces tend to be very efficient in the sense that you do shut them down, they reduced a lot of power consumption. Now, everybody went home and consumed more power at home. But if you think about the normal work cycle where people are at home, then they go to work and then they come back again, the home is typically not as diligently shut down as office spaces. So homes have a sort of always on certain amount of power consumption going on. And you yeah, I expect a bunch of people. Efficient. Yeah, I bet a bunch of people just leave their AC set to whatever. Exactly. I, ha and I have one of these nests. Feel sin. Uh, I've come to, as I've been studying my house, heated floors. Those electrically heated floors consume a lot more power than you realize. And if you learn how long it takes to get them to temperature and so forth, so that you can shut them down day and heat them up when you need them, it, that's a lot of power. That's a kilowatt per floor per day, easy. Oh, how interesting! Yeah, that is a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and air conditioners too. And I suspect that people, a lot of people, don't shut them down. So I saw an article recently that talked about, oh we're actually being set back by people working from home because we all now have our computers on and our lights on and our AC or our heater or, you know, depending on the time of the year right. at everybody's house instead of one giant office. Yes. But I, what I don't believe that took into account was the person who lives 45 minutes away from the office and commutes with a, an old suburban SUV that, is yeah. burning extra gas, right? Like it's, I think it just looked at the energy of the office and the energy of the homes and said, oh, there's more yeah. at the homes, right? But in limited uh, commute. Well, but I don't think that's true either. In, in some respects, you have the same computer, if not a less efficient computer at the office. And so that yeah. those things were turned off. I think the move to the cloud actually ends up being energy efficient because per business owned servers tend to be less actually gaining efficiency in terms of power consumption by shifting those workloads into the cloud. Those machines run at a much higher constant utilization rate. So there's fewer CPUs serving far more workloads that way. Right, um, right. How many VPCs, virtual servers run on top of, uh, you know, one piece of hardware? A exactly. Lot. I mean, a lot. And, and of course, they're paid by the, uh, for that, they, their margin is in that optimization, where typically, your owned servers just don't have that same level of utilization. But I think that the biggest thing that, that created in the West the huge power drops was that folks shut down those buildings. They turned as much off as they could, uh, far more reliably than anything else. Uh, the drop in, in oil, recognizing that, that oil consumption in the form of gasoline and kerosene, 50% of all oil is going into road transport and air. And so that drop was tremendous during the peak of the pandemic. In April of 2020, the oil industry calls that black April because it was right. if in the West, it was like 30% reduction. You know, on a typical day in 20, the world consumed about 80 million barrels of oil. Uh, in April of 2020, it was like 45 million. Yeah, that's and amazing. This is the thing is like that oil moves all the time. And so the, if you recall, there was a crisis where oil actually went to Nick because nobody had anywhere to store it. I remember that. And there was yeah. all these people like, investing in sort of indirectly in oil. And what I think there were some of them, they didn't realize that they were on the hook to store that oil. Exactly. And, and then they got oil tankers hammered. arriving at re refineries with nowhere to offload because the tanks were all full. And now the ship was effectively a storage media machine. Like that's how bad it got for a month. Uh, and it hasn't fully recovered. Like oil consumption is still down. They don't expect uh, road transport consumption. And I'm referencing the IEA report. This is the International Energy Association. It's very challenging to get good energy data, uh, quality energy data. 
Uh, and these, this is a group that are operated out of Paris, they're, but they're worldwide and they are very agnostic. They're not owned by any energy companies. You know, typically when you go looking for data like this, you will find energy companies telling you about how their energy is great. Reasonable report you can get in terms of, of levelizing right, all right. of those numbers. You've heard and the so, clean natural gas. Yeah, well, <laughs> cleaner right. than coal. It's right? a relative I mean, statement. Give them it? that. It's about half the emission level of coal yep. with significant emissions. And it's cheap, right? And that's why natural gas has done so well. Um, so the IEA, I mean, they break down a lot of these pandemic details. And one of the points they made is like, road transport consumption will probably reach 2019 levels by 2021. But air transport won't. The air transport is going to take longer to come back. Oh, people aren't flying. Yeah. Uh, and that's uh, it's had a huge impact. Yes, we move a lot of stuff by cargo, but we move far more people by air. And so airplanes that are still parked and the decrease in consumption all around is it's not small. And so in that sense, our emissions have dropped a, a non-trivial amount in the process. Um, and the good news is when that power consumption drop happened, the power plants that got turned off were the dirtiest ones. So coal consumption went down dramatically in 2020 because power consumption went down. That's really good. I mean, that was the plants that they turned off, except in China. <laughs> China <laughs> actually added coal consumption because China increased their power consumption throughout the pandemic. They also, I mean, to give fair credit to China, there may have been 50% of the increase in coal consumption in 2020. There were also 50% of the increase in renewables over 2020. So I mean, yeah. China is growing very rapidly. They're building out a lot of infrastructure and they did not stop through the pandemic. They did a better job of containing the pandemic as well. I, mean, I don't know if that's true. What they certainly did was did a good job of containing any data about their pandemic response. <laughs> yeah, okay, fair. They also you know, have the, the, uh, the freedom, or not, or the, that's not the right word, they have the flexibility to impo impose rules differently than yes. suggestions that we have like in North America and Europe. Well, and, and one of the big cases is like the whole world has benefited from the fact that the Chinese government chose to simply build gigantic solar power plants to manufacture solar at a massive scale and drove the price down of solar. It, yeah. it probably wasn't the most economically efficient way to go about it, but it's the advantage of having, you know, the single party rule system that says thou shalt build big solar factories. And they did. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and yeah, again, sent the price of solar to the floor to the, to the point where we now in the West use solar differently. You know, once upon a time, solar panels were so precious, you put them, on articulated arms to aim them perfectly at the sun throughout the day to maximize utilization. These days, and, and they're expensive. And for a yeah. lot, and so when Germany did this huge push towards solar as they started to try and wind down their nuclear power, they were putting all of these solar panels in, all aimed south, because they're in the north, and they get the most light if they're physically aimed south until they were generating so much power at the middle of the day when they didn't need it, that it was actually a problem for their grid. And they don't do that anymore. They now point their panels east and west, which seems foolish because it means you get less utilization per panel. But what you're actually doing is smoothing out your power generation. You don't need as much power in the evening. What you need is more power in the morning and more power in the evening. And moving those panels, using each panel less efficiently actually makes a more efficient grid. How oh, interesting. I, so I, I think the area I really want to focus on with our conversation is that storage side, because I think that's the magic of unlocking things. Sure. Before, before we do, have you seen Project Sunroof? I have. It doesn't work in Canada, unfortunately. Uh, but, that's uh, unfortunate. The sun yeah. is totally different there or no? Just so, to, yeah, well, you know, it has a U in the in its name. So, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> So this uh, thing lets you go to your address or anyone's address and click mm -hmm. on it and say it, it gives you a, a heat map of the roof of your house for the amount of energy it's going to receive. And unfortunately here, you know, I'm also in the Pacific Northwest. And one of the things that I think is glorious about here is, you know, right in my yard, I have 150 year old trees that are beautiful. super high, right? Which are amazing mm -hmm. <laughs> unless you want solar 
yeah radiation Unless you want your sunlight to hit places yeah <laughs> Exactly. There's or, like a little or, sliver or Starlink for that matter. <laughs> yeah. Both, both are out for me. Like, yeah. like I actually had some solar people come out and estimate us. Does it make any sense to, I mean, like put the money aside. Does it even make sense just from a climate perspective? And they're like, you know what? It's going to take five years to pay off the carbon of manufacturing the, just the panels. And like, oh, right. right. Yeah. This is, yeah. this is like too inefficient to justify it unfortunately but yeah your yields are just too low and, you, and it's like if you really wanted to reduce your carbon footprint spending that money on the best appliance the most efficient appliances you could have right or, or redoing your insulation or something yeah. like that or yeah. even using things like uh uh like the tesla power peak power consumption times right yeah. like those things represent you know, they, the problem with, with most grid power is that it pretty much generates the same amount of power all the time. Grid is not that flexible. It takes a while to spin up those big power plants. And so it's for peak. And if so, most people, you know, the concept of power wall was, hey, if I can take you off the grid during peak, if I can store power at the cheap times and then use that power at the peak times, we can turn off a peak power plant. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it seems completely reasonable. You know, there's been a mm -hmm. lot of success, I think, with the grid scale utility level power pack that Tesla does. And I think yeah, if you had uh, a lot if, of success, there's been a few. I mean, been, Australia being the famous one. Yeah, that's the uh, one I was thinking of for sure. Yeah, well, uh, they they just had a big fire at one of them. In terms, of, you know, lithium ion ion burns prolifically. Yeah, I was gonna uh, call that out. Where was that one? That was yeah. That one was definitely, uh, I guess I can't pull it up. Yeah. But, but the, big, yeah, the biggest advantage of battery over all storage methods, period, is recovery. That it's It comes about 90% efficient. So put 100, get 90 kilowatts out in exchange for expensive. Yeah. Right. That, that's the issue is that they're expensive installations. They do have fire risks. Um, they're, they, the, the, constrained although we're starting to see some other battery technologies come down the pipe um the the famous the big news stories at the moment are around iron-based batteries so liquid iron uh, it's not the iron's not liquid but it's a liquid electrolyte iron battery essentially rust batteries so you yeah. when you oxidize the iron you can move you can store electricity and then you deoxidize to release the electricity Oh, interesting. It's almost like electrolysis, but applied to iron. Yeah, and it's the same. And fundamentally, that's what all batteries are, right? It's doing a chemical reaction that that cre creates new compounds. Um, you're not going to find iron batteries in your phone anytime soon. They are big, they are heavy, but they are very grid scale. Um, the most advanced batteries that I've seen that seem to have the best backing right now are a company called Form Energy. Okay. So they've raised about $125 million, which seems like a lot, and it is in this space, but the power is hundreds of millions of dollars. So they haven't got a deal yet, but they've been, had some breakthroughs in their battery. Their typical battery unit is about the size of a dishwasher. So again, that's new. wouldn't be good for, for a phone. It's also because it has a liquid in it, its orientation really matters. So these are meant to be held in place mounted on the ground. Um, they are run pretty hot. So they're not the sort of thing you want to be around, but they're cheap. Like typically with lithium ion batteries today, we're coming in around a hundred, it may be as low as $80 a kilowatt. And believe me, like when a hundred dollars a kilowatt was class batteries, that was considered the point where now we are price competitive with internal combustion cars. And that breakthrough was like exactly. in the past couple of years. These uh, iron batteries are coming in at like twenty dollars a kilowatt. Wow! So, are they more stable than the lithium ones as well? They're yeah, they're le far less fire risk, um, and uh, slow, steady discharging. So, one of the claims to fame for the Form Energy battery is uh, full a hundred hours. So, the idea that again, if you think about what does a grid want, it's that ability to have stable power all of the time and so being able to count on a long duration battery uh makes a lot of sense so this is not the kind of battery you'd want in your home like we have this home-based hey we're going to spend less on the grid we're going to put some solar panels in. we're going to put some power walls in and 
we'll use the grid as backup and take less pressure, pressure off of that. But grid scale power, you're starting to see different kinds of storage system. And this is the first battery technology I've seen that's really based on grid style storage and has that really high efficiency rating. But it's not the only way to store power. Yeah. In fact, we, Bef before you know, we move off of energy. Do. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Before we move off of the, just the battery side, I do want to ask you, if you use your crystal ball and look into the future, do you see a world where we've got renewable energy locally generated, like on roofs in California and maybe a power wall on a house? Like I could see California mandating every house comes with some sort of local battery. Yeah, they have, and they have mandated thing. solar. And you now yes, have to exactly. apply for a permit to not put solar on your house. Which, um, perfect. I mean, California has often done these kinds of things. The battery technology is a little trickier. They are expensive. They are relatively fragile. But yeah, it's possible. But it's easier solved with grid in some respects. Yeah, I was going to say, do you see that future? Or do you see a future where we've got you know, massive grid scale type of generation yeah. and storage? I think it's going to be lots of both because there's good reasons for both. Now, and one of the challenges here when you start thinking about this microgrid behavior of having grid is the grid needs to get much smarter. We need internet technology applied to electrical generation and utilization. Uh, it's because it's a peer-to-peer -peer kind of problem. And I mean, we're in computing, so we get that. But if you go talk to people who've worked, peer-to-peer -peer is bizarre to them. Right? They are very much a, a fewest number of power plants necessary to supply the load and a single set of wires to feed it out. Um, redundancy is an expensive, often unnecessary thing. And so, but that is clearly changing as we're, we are creating more automation. So I think people will have a choice on how they want to consume in that respect, but we're starting to perfect grid storage and mostly because our renewal deliver a levelized load. They deliver when they deliver and we need to levelize with other strategies and that's where storage comes into play. Yeah. All right. Oh, two other things really quick. Um, well, maybe one altogether. So mm -hmm. we had a lot of resistance in the U S to putting up windmills, wind farms off the East coast because mm -hmm. the people with their yachts, when they went a little farther out, they would see the windmills yeah. and they, they really hated it. And then out in the desert in Nevada, though, what would have been a tremendously large solar grid scale solar is canceled because the electric, the article headline is the U.S. largest solar farm is canceled because Nevada locals don't want to look at it while they're out on their all train vehicles, which I, I love riding all train vehicles. I'm not against that, but, you know, well, and <laughs> in Nevada, like also the problem of, yeah, I mean, people, there is always an NIMBY effect. Um, what's interesting about a place like Nevada and New Mexico is that they could be, they're doing helio solar. So rather than using photovoltaic, they're using reflectors to heat molten salt. And uh, what's it, what's interesting about that at that scale is the salt gets, that it still generates power through the night. You know, we, I mean, yeah. there's a bunch of ways to use molten salt. It's used in nuclear reactors, it's used in power storage systems, it's used in helio systems. The thing that's powerful about salts, whatever they may be, sodium-based salts, fluorine-based salts, doesn't really matter, is that their operating liquid temperature, the temperature that they turn from a solid into a liquid is around 400 degrees Celsius, varies from material to material, but their boiling point when they'll turn into a gas is past. So you yeah. have this huge operating range of liquid, right? As opposed to water, which only has a hundred degree range. And I'm using Celsius because I'm a civilized human um, for my for the liquid range. And that's not a, the advantage being I can do flash steam turbines against 500 degrees Celsius salts just as easily as I can do against 800 degrees salts and so forth. And so they carry heat long enough that you can bridge nighttime with it. Right. So that's even that's, a form of storage in a sense. It, it is. And it has coast, been, yeah. they, there is a mechanism of like, if we have more solar than we know what to do with, why don't we switch it to heaters to heat this salt up? Because after it gets past a certain temperature threshold, it'll generate. Now it's not because of that floor, that minimum temperature, molten salt storage is not as efficient as battery storage. Battery storage comes in in the 90%, molten salts come in at 70%. On the other hand, they're very persistent. They are less fewer risks. Um, they're a well-known technology. So if you have the materials, it's a good solution. 
Yeah. You know, the, there, but there are more, right? Like for years we've been using pumped uh, hydro storage where you, you pump water up a hill and then when you need it, you let the water come back down. Right. So, yeah. So let's talk about some of the ones that are not straight, straight a battery. Right. So like you said, that one's been pretty popular. Been around you a long the, time. Yeah. I was really blown away when I first heard about that. So the idea is you might have, you might be at the, the face of a mountain and there might yeah. be a mountain lake up right there. So you could have a lake at the bottom and a lake at the top. And as you generate the energy, all the extra just pumps the water to the top. And then when you let it out, you run it through some kind of hydroelectric thing. Yeah, put it through a turbine way. on the way back down, you get the power. And that's got about an 80% return. So more efficient than molten salt, not as efficient as battery. Uh, it's terrain specific. Mountain. Uh, yeah. Now there's another gravity solution uh, that doesn't need a mountain. It's called it's called crane based storage, where they use a very tall crane and they use the electric power to lift concrete blocks and stack them higher and higher and higher. Uh, and then when you want to discharge, pick the block up and let it come down and spin a turbine, uh, spin a generator to generate electricity from it. That's kind of nouveau. The current efficiency. Yep. Nobody's built one to scale yet, but the experimental in the 80 percent range so there's challenges with the water one right you're yeah you're moving water up high and what if it what if the dam or the, the pipes were to break and to flood the city that it was near yeah. well and, and or it, there's you, a drought the all sorts point. of things it's also there's only so much water you can pump up like what happens when you run out of water what happens when you run out of room like now it's going to over it typically they're dammed water storage like the dam can only hold so much too so it has limits where the crane based reach the blocks and doesn't get past his leverage moments you can put a lot of blocks in place you can build a crane air yeah. larger you can put its arm out longer so that's interesting although it's they're they're going to be more expensive and and have more maintenance solution yeah you can build more cranes you could dig a hole in the ground and have this mm -hmm. giant giant block of concrete or whatever go up and down you know yeah. hundreds and of meters in and under underground right yeah, well, lots of blocks, right? So when you have excess power, you're lifting blocks and stacking them high, and then and more and more and more of them. And then when you need the power, you're li you're letting them come back down one after the other. Um, you have to levelize the power. Like there's some tricks to it. It's not a simple solution, but it works anywhere that you've got some flat land. Yeah, right. which it's, with a bulldozer is almost anywhere. Yeah, <laughs> with some enthusiasm and some dynamite, you can make anything flat. <laughs> that's right. So yeah. that seems like a really good solution. And so this is the thing that I, I really am excited to talk to you about because mm -hmm. I I get so frustrated when I hear things like, well, it would be great if this pipe dream you had could come true and you could run stuff on solar and wind, but it's never going to work because I want to watch TV at night and not be cold at night. So it doesn't work. It's never, it's unsafe. And there's all this creative stuff going on, like pumped hydro, like molten salt, like we could just dig a hole in the ground and use some really complicated, well, um, we, like, we, like we've also reduced, that, yeah. You know, you take the mixture of the, the iron based batteries, the 20 kilowatt, uh, $20 per kilowatt hour battery with wind and solar, which are now so cheap and have grown a lot through the pandemic, too. They're now, the second largest source of power and you know they've had the biggest growth and admittedly the largest renewable is still hydroelectric but solar and, and wind are growing rapidly very very successful the, yeah. the the offshore wind power movement is an interesting one where they're getting uh, not just in the water right now they when they go in the water with uh with wind power they're doing near shore not too deep 100 feet 200 feet something can anchor to the bottom on but they've now hit a point where they're ready to start using more of the oil rig technologies to do floating turbines. So now you can go a couple of hundred miles offshore or more off the continental shelf. And right. Run that the was the, out there. So you two of the challenges that I saw when I was thinking about that was one, you've got to dig down into the ground and you're disturbing the ecosystem of you know oysters and, and whatever, right? That like might be there if you're going to, mount these things to the ground mm -hmm. the other is with these giant windmills and you know, when i was in germany we were around these huge windmills all over and just the sense of being near them is really oh, yeah. crazy right? and believe me the offshore one i mean twice the wingspan of 747 like these 10 megawatt turbines 
they're so big you can't even get your head around how big they yeah. are. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's just titan it titans. They're just yeah. But to have them on a floating platform away from everyone, uh, where the noise isn't, where the sea life is not as plentiful, where the sea birds are not as plentiful. Yeah, that's what uh, I was going to say. Is the other one is people would say, look, these are harmful to all the birds because there are so many bird strikes. But you know, ten miles offshore, there's not that much bird traffic. Well, and now we're talking two hundred miles offshore. Like, okay, even you're further. Well, uh, you're off the end of the continental shelf, so you're way out there. The bird traffic is substantial. Um, and, and the, so that's a far less disruptive technology all around. Um, it increases costs, but the equipment's getting cheaper and the power generation is valuable and it's, you know, minimally do, um, they're, they're smart enough to survive severe weather. Right? So we, you know, that's continuing to grow dramatically, yeah. uh, for a reason. And, and the mod taking the known technology for working offshore and turning it into automated platforms for, for, for wind makes a lot of sense. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, when I, you know, circling back around, when I hear people in the news or whatever say, oh, we can't, you know, we can't have this renewable future because there is so much fluctuation and uncertainty, I feel like it's it's just a lack of creativity. Yeah, well, uh, I, think it, I mean, these are old arguments. We've been solving them steadily. <laughs> Exactly. Like we put people on the moon with like wristwatch level computing. Yeah. Surely we can build some cranes or build some batteries. Yeah. And, and well, and we also did it in a very dangerous way. The way we sent people to the moon was extremely risky. That's why we stopped. <laughs> right. We, yeah. we, we want power that's safe and reliable. And, and that's yeah. uh, fairly not to talk a little bit about nuclear because nuclear can be safe. It yeah. just hasn't been. We stopped spending money on it. Uh, we didn't we stopped spending it. money almost at the moment that we were moving beyond yeah. like water-based nuclear where stuff would fail safer rather than Fukushima type fail. Sure. Funny thing about Fukushima. There was actually six reactors at Fukushima. We only, and it, only people only talk about one. four was, oh, four was offline and one through three melted down. Nobody talks about five and six. Five and six were exactly the same design, but they had been modernized to have passive cool down. And so when they were one through four were, and then they lost their generators, just like one through four were, they cooled down on their own without events. Oh, interesting. I didn't realize that. That's cool. Yeah. It's, and, it, and they're undamaged, right? Now, the question is, why did one through four have passive cool down? Because one through four were several years older and the upgrade kits to make them passively cooled down were expensive and took a two years to install. And since the plants only had about five, six years of lifespan worth them, it was a financial decision not to install the passive cool downs by Tepco. Probably something they want to take back. Yeah, but, you know, that's true of a lot of things. You know, <laughs> I'm pretty sure the, you know, in Three Mile Island, the operators had asked for an indicator light for the pressure relief valve to show it was opened or closed. And they put the light in, but they wired it to the switch, not to the valve. So you push the button, the light turned on. You push the button, the light turned off. Nobody knew what the valve was doing. And the valve sat open and allowed water, it allowed water to escape from the vessel. Or was exposed and partially melted down. You know, yeah. pe people make mistakes. But part of this is reactor size. The, the push to measures in the 300 megawatt class because that's the size of the coal power plants. They knew how to operate that size. They knew how the turbines work. So they made these bigger nuclear reactors. And that's problematic because they are hard to cool down. Now we've learned as soon as you shrink the, the down to a more natural size to so the 60 megawatt class, you just don't have that problem. Yeah. So, and those are the reactors you find in in aircraft aircraft carriers and in submarines, those kinds of places. And that's what you're seeing in small modular nuclear reactors are the 60 megawatt class. And these are the kind of reactors that you build in a factory rather than build on site. So they're not bespoke, they're standardized, they're built with machines, they're consistent, they're easy to test and validate. And so they're very reliable. You fuel them once, they run for 20 years on the fuel. So no refueling every year. You run them solid for 20 years. They are passively shut down because they're small enough. You put the control rods in place, they will simply go cold. And so the, the folks I think are furthest along in the modular nuclear, they actually got their clearance contracts 
um, they got certified by the, um, the Atomic Energy Association last year is New Scale. And they actually have a contract in Utah to build out the first modular plant. And their plan is to actually put 12 of these together, you know, in, in, on the site so that you get that same kind of 300, 400 megawatt power generation that is normal in grid, but they just have multiple small redundant reactors that they can swap them out as they need to be replaced. And when you, at the end of 20 years, you don't refuel it. You, re you lift it back out of the ground. You take it back to a factory where it is and you put a new one in place. So yeah. this is a very different approach to nuclear. Yeah. It's going to have to break a lot of uh, stereotypes and, and yes. fears, right? But, it, you know, the, the, the atomic has now signed on with them. Uh, so because it has passed. And so the, the, the Utah project, by the way, is, is struggling now for new scale for the simple reason that costs have gone up. And so some of the municipalities that signed on to buy power for them, they're now finding out the new power price is higher. And they're like, hey, I can get a natural gas plant for less than that. Like, why am I paying for this? And that's part of the challenge here. Price is everything. Cheaper winds getting cheaper. Natural gas has always been cheap. And, uh, and so these guys are always struggling with, as they develop these new technologies, they're trying to get those costs absorbed by their early sales and people who want to pay for it. Yeah. It's, it's a, a tough chicken and egg, right? Yeah. So let's talk about some uh, more storage. I do think the nuclear side is, is really interesting because it's been shunned so badly since the 70s. But it, it is carbon, it's zero carbon, right? Yeah. Uh, it, basically. It, it I mean, you've got to mine the carbon. stuff, but yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, it, it, you know, it consumes carbon to, if you're going to mine uranium or find uranium, ship uranium, like, those are issues. It still has a consumable, although that the efficiency of that consumable, it's hard to get your head around how efficient it is in comparison, how yeah. little you refine uranium it takes to run a power plant compared to the amount of coal or natural gas it takes to run a power yeah. plant. Uh, the, and the problem is that the that most people are familiar with, so pressurized water designs, uh, light water designs, we're really meant to produce plutonium. Like the reason that the United States matured that technology was to make bombs. Electricity, they get plutonium out of their cores. And so it was designed to be disassembled every six months, have the cores reprocessed, get the plutonium out, make new cores and load them back in again. And then they stopped reprocessing cores. Uh, during the, the, um, the Ford administration, when Carter was running against them with the anti-nuclear proliferation, Ford's attempt to get reelected, he said, I'll do what, what Jimmy wants us to do and stop reprocessing cores. And America has never reprocessed a fuel core since. They just wow. store them. Yeah. yeah. And that's, so that's also game. not good. Yeah. No. The French, who 80% of their power comes from pressurized water nuclear, have continued to modernize their plants. They always have reprocessed their cores. In fact, they now reprocess plutonium into their cores. It's called a MOX core. And so they're actually burning plutonium. And so they don't have the, radi the, the radiation storage problems. They're not because they're reprocessing their fuel. And, you know, by the way, when Germany decided to stop using their nuclear plants after Fukushima, to have enough power, nuclear power from France, like, that's how that worked. Yeah, Modernizing, wow. not that, you know, nuclear plants have their problems and they need to be modernized and they need to be more efficient than they are. Uh, and there are better technologies that still should be matured. But these small modulars deal with most of that and with very relatively little new research needed to be done. And still it's a struggle. Yeah. Yeah. It's super, super interesting. Um, so we only have about five minutes left, Yeah, but I do want to talk about some more interest, uh, energy storage stuff. That's really interesting that people mm -hmm. maybe don't think about is what if I just got a giant, really balanced piece of steel and spun it really fast? The flywheel like solution. <laughs> exactly. Well, and, and modern flywheels um, are better than ever. These days they use air bearings. Uh, they, some of them have even seen versions that have superconductive bearings so that vacuum. So you've, you re, the whole trick with a flywheel is minimizing friction. Like how fast can we get it spinning and, and stay in shape? And, uh, um, and how long do we extract it? Now, they're not as efficient as batteries. They're 85, they, they have their own me mechanicals, like there's stuff that needs to be taken care of. 
but essentially they're a part a part of a motor. Like you only have to put a field coil around that flat wheel to extract power from it. So um, they're expensive to manufacture and they take specialized operators to run. They um, batteries in some respects, while expensive also are easier. So, but these are, Flywheel's been around a long time. When I, you know, when I was a kid and, and trying to get computer time in the university, that computer backup system was Flywheel for power. It was like oh, 200 wow. really? instead of Flywheels. Yeah, we went down to the Flywheel room one time. And you, and you, and you talk about that threatening hum, Flywheel lets you know, if something goes wrong here, you're not even going to feel it. <laughs> when, <laughs> when Flywheels disintegrate, that's a lot of mass moving in a hurry. Yeah. Uh, so they are um, they're interesting machines and they're an interesting approach to storing power. I think each of these power storage solutions, you know, has merit depending on where you are and what materials are expensive at the time. You know, flywheels count on heavy ferrous metals being inexpensive and those sophisticated bearing systems to allow them to spin well and spin them up and spin them down. But yeah. They're absolutely viable. I, I feel like they've gotten modernized quite a bit recently. Mm hmm. Well, everybody, it's it is the Rebco um, superconductive um, a huge difference because you because you're floating on a bearing with no friction because it's not touching anything. It's in a back in an evacuated space. Right. The base and you the way you like speed. you said you extract energy is through magnetic. Yes. Stuff. So there's not no physical it, contact. Yeah, turn gears. Yeah. 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 That's fantastic. Yeah, it's a it's a very modern way to think, but yeah, and they make sense at a grid level. They should. Yeah. They need to be large. They need to be professionally operated, maintained. Yeah. The other one, I'm not sure if I have a picture of it here. Actually, I don't think I do. Uh, the other one has to do with um, not storing water, but storing compressed air. Yeah. So where we see these are where they have airtight large spaces like old salt mines for example yep. where they've done mining the salt but effectively the space is and so they can pump pressure into them they have efficiency problems to have a minimum pressure so you've got to pump for a while before you get to a pressure that would spin a turbine uh so they, they come in in the 70 percent range uh, a little bit lower but if you have the space like the expensive part would be making the tank right Pumps right. are not that expensive and not that difficult, you know. They, but if you've got a huge volume of airtight space, it's worth utilizing that. Let me throw one other idea at you. You know, on okay. one hand, there's the idea of we're generating electricity and we need to store it for when we can't generate it. Then there's also the we're generating more electricity we need. Where do we put this? Yeah. If 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 you didn't need it for electricity, like why would you bother storing it to battery? Can you turn excess and valuable? And so one of the areas of research going on right now is water desalinization. We have a freshwater problem. So yeah. why not, when you have excess electricity available, use that electricity to desalinate water. If you're turning that, that excess power into something valuable, freshwater. Um, there's a version of this. It's actually a kind of pump storage solution. So we pump seawater up to a high and then the drain system for that to lower it back down again actually has a reverse osmosis filter on it and just uses gravity to extract the fresh water. Yeah, how interesting. So taking exi existing design power storage and instead of using a turbine with that water coming down, using it to extract fresh water from salt. Well, that's a lot of, a lot of options, a lot of different flexibilities for where you're located Mm -hmm. By a mountain lake, do you have yeah. a, a, or, or a mine? Pumped reverse is another solution. It just consumes more energy. But if you have the yeah. access energy, why not? And if you need the water, water desalinization yeah. is getting more popular all the time. You think about the drought that's going on in southern in, in Southern California. The Israelis are leading the world in water desalinization. It's a desert climate. It has water problems, but they don't have a water problem anymore. About twenty five percent of their water is now desalinated water. They um, use the reverse osmosis systems for. Yeah. The challenge is that most of these mechanisms take a while to get up to speed. So, you know, it can take a day to get a reverse osmosis system stabilized and pumping well. And if you're trying the hour window where you're making too much solar, 
you don't have it, the system's not efficient for that. Yeah, for it doesn't modern. respond fast enough, right? So there's a push to modernize to update these systems so that you have a 20 minute uptime. Right? Within 20 minutes, we can with this. So that three hour window in midday where we have more solar we know to do with, we can put it over to the reverse osmosis plant and make fresh water with it. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Richard, thank you so much for being here and, and sharing all these ideas and doing the research for us. I, I think. Yeah, he said it's a pleasure when you ask me because it's, these are all notes I'm keeping, but then I spend a few days sorting them out into a set of narratives. Like, uh, what are the important bits of all yeah. that? So it's a pleasure for me too. And really fun to talk to you. Yeah, yeah, it's always great to have you here. And uh, who knows what we'll talk about next time? But it's, <sighs> well, it's great. Coax is yeah. throw subject at me. Mean, you know, I'm interested in everything. That's right. I do know that for sure. All right. So <laughs> thank you for being here as always. And yeah, have a good day. And hey, we actually made this work from space. Yay, yeah. They tell it, 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 it see a little after that. <laughs> That's right. All right. Bye, Richard. See you.